How's it going, everybody? So in the past, I've received comments that have kind of inspired the creation of different videos. Sometimes I would go to reply and I would end up typing up such a lengthy explanation that my reply starts to look like a video script. So halfway through writing it, I say, screw it. Let's just do a video. And then sometimes the idea seems like such a fun topic to cover that all I can do is think about discussing it. So at that point, I'll probably write a reply. And then on top of that, I will also end up doing a video about it. And now that I have a Patreon, that gives me a whole new outlet to get these topics suggested to me. And I recently received a message from Ellie Wallace that gave me one of these topics that I could really sink my teeth into. Ellie is in the process of writing a fantasy novel that takes place in a world that is home to humans, but otherwise is populated by flora and fauna inspired by the late Permian and early Triassic. And she messaged me asking for my help and input with a particular factor of this world. She wants to know what stem mammals from this time period would hypothetically be a good fit for domestication. More specifically, filling a similar role to the small lap or purse dog. Why on earth would anybody do this? And I was going to respond to this message, but then I decided that it would actually be an excellent topic for a video. I'm really excited to dive into this topic, especially because I have been dying to make some speculative biology related content for a really long time. If this video does well, maybe it can become a new thing on this channel. So I gave it a lot of thought, and I also went to a couple of people who are even more experienced in this subject than I am to try to make our best educated guess as to what stem mammal would make the best hypothetical purse synapsid. But before we get into any of that, I should take a moment first to discuss in general what exactly is speculative biology. Speculative biology, or speculative evolution, is a term that refers to the hypothetical field of science that makes predictions and hypotheses on the evolution of life in a wide variety of scenarios. This has been used by many different authors and world builders to help flesh out their world, as well as trying to answer different hypothetical questions about if different events on Earth may have gone differently, or speculating about the possibilities of life on other planets. One example, and this is probably the most covered topic in this entire field, what if the extinction 66 million years ago never took place? What if, by some astronomical miracle, that meteor missed us? Now, as you can imagine, a great many things would be drastically different if that one event changed. For one, of course, we would not be here. And maybe someday I'll tackle such a monumental task. But many people already have. In fact, Dougal Dixon, seen as the father of speculative biology, wrote a book titled The New Dinosaurs on this very subject basically talking about if the non-avian dinosaurs lasted past the Cretaceous and throughout the Cenozoic era. It's one of three books that he wrote, one of which being After Man, where he speculates on the future evolution of our current world if humans were to remove themselves from the scenario, another popular trope. And then we have the slightly more controversial third book, Man After Man, where he talks about possible future species of humanity. And, well, the less said about that one, probably the better. There was a certain point in time where the man appeared to have gone full alien space bats. And a lot of this seems like it's just blind guessing, but the difference between this and any other fantasy writing is that the people making this are trying to make something that is scientifically plausible under our current understanding of evolutionary science. I love this because I have always found evolution fascinating, and this is a way to actually be creative with it. But now it is time for me to tackle my very first speculative biology prompt. And for this one, I will have to channel my innermost Clint from Clint's Reptiles to find out what would make the best pet Permian stem mammal. Well, hi there. So the first thing that I did in my search for the perfect stem mammal house pet was to look into different popular media to see if anyone else had approached this idea before. And as you might imagine, there was not a whole lot to work with. Obviously, in just about any work of fiction, Mesozoic animals tend to take the lion's share when it comes to roles in paleosubject fiction, especially dinosaurs. But as luck would have it, there was one exception to this rule. 
the British program from the early 2000s that we've talked about before, Primeval. And right off the bat, I want to say this, Rex is disqualified. He's a Solora Saravis, which, despite being heavily anthropomorphized in the show, is actually a true reptile rather than a stem mammal. But there were several other animals from the Permian that were featured in this show, and even one that was treated as a pet to the cast. So many people who are familiar with the show may not even remember this, because they were only in a handful of episodes. But there were a pair of Dicynodonts that got stuck in the present. We've talked about this group of animals before with our video about Bulbasaurus. They are a group of herbivorous synapsids that were massively successful throughout the Permian and Triassic periods. So right there, that would make them the first good candidates to consider. And some species were even the right size for what we're talking about. But unfortunately, under the parameters of this prompt, at least the way that I'm going to approach it, that's where the case for them starts to fall apart. What we're looking for is an animal that could be a good analog for a dog. And if we look at the domestication of dogs, the original reason why we domesticated them in the first place was to help alert and defend humans against danger, as well as assist with hunting. Tiny lap dogs didn't come along until later when the need for hunting partners started to lessen. Dicynodonts may have been able to help with alerting us of danger, especially if they had some form of loud warning vocalization, but these animals were all herbivores. Now, I'm not saying that in this hypothetical scenario there would be no use for domesticating some kind of dicynodont. They could have very well been used as several different forms of livestock. But if this animal is going to start out as a hunting partner, as dogs did, it may be easier to start off with something that already has some kind of hunting instincts. But, as luck would have it, the Permian did have plenty of different predators that could potentially work better. Now, when you're talking about predators from the late Permian in particular, there's one name that is the first one that comes to mind. And no, it's not Dimetrodon. They were more of a early to mid Permian stem mammal. But these ones were not only the largest land carnivores at the time, but they were also the very first animals to evolve saber teeth. They're called the Gorgonopsids. And they were the pinnacle of synapsid evolution until true mammals took over in the Cenozoic. These were by far the most feared predators of Pangaea, and in large species like Enostrancevia, were between the size of a tiger and a bear. And right there is where we run into our first problem, because if we go back to our real life analog, at that time we did live alongside animals like big cats and bears. But you may notice that we never managed to domesticate them. And that is because it should go without saying that trying to tame an apex predator that's bigger than you is a bad idea. And who knows, maybe there were some people throughout the rise of man who may have tried this at one time or another. But they have been forgotten to the sands of history because their bloodlines probably abruptly ended with them. Unlike with Dicynodonts, humans would not be able to tame these creatures. In fact, these animals would probably be one of those dangers that early people in this environment would need some type of guard dog to warn them about. Much the same way that the barking of our first companions warned us of the presence of things like lions, saber-toothed cats, and bears in the shadows beyond our campfires in the night. And in order to get to the point where we start selectively breeding animals to make purse pets, we have to survive this time first. So, in order to find the right animal to start with, we do have to start with a predator, but also one of modest enough size to not be an overwhelming danger to humans trying to tame it. You know, like a wolf. When scouring through all these possibilities, one thing that I did notice was that during the Permian, animals were generally around the same size as many animals that we see today. Gorgonopsids were big predators, but they weren't reaching the 12 and 13 meters that large carnivores would during the Mesozoic. So for this reason, I personally think that humans could work out a living in the Permian at least easier than in the Cretaceous. It would still be dangerous and challenging, but I think it could be done. But whether we were trying to do it in the Permian or the Pleistocene, it would probably be much easier with a friend. 
And in this hypothetical evolutionary journey, I believe I have found the perfect group of animals. They were actually a relative of the Gorgonopsids, expert predators in their own right, but of a much more manageable size. This group is called the Theracephalians. Many species, like Glanosuchus, are even about the size of a wolf. At this size, they probably would not be as quick to consider humans a source of food. This was one of the first groups of stem mammals to show signs of being fully endothermic. Also, they're thought to have had the beginnings of the type of ear structure that we associate with true mammals. So with all these features, these guys make the strongest case yet for domestication into something somewhat dog-like. And although we're not sure about this, some scientists even think that these animals may have had fur. However, there is one small issue that our hypothetical Permian settler might face. You see, on top of all of these very mammalian traits, many Theracephalians show signs that they may have had a trait that we normally associate with different kinds of reptile. A venomous bite. The teeth of some species have grooves in them that appear to be for administering toxins, and structures found on some skulls of well-preserved specimens appear to be venom glands. So this would definitely complicate things. Venom would allow these dog-sized predators to punch well above their body weight, and probably make them far too dangerous for us to hope to domesticate. However, not all Theracephalians show these features. Perhaps in this way, these animals were more similar to snakes, with some species being venomous and some being non-venomous. If this were the case, it would just be a matter of finding out which of these animals were safe to approach. Once we learn that, it would only be a matter of figuring out which of these species had the best temperament and then selecting the individuals that were the most friendly, but still maintaining their ability to hunt, and their ability to guard their new human partners. In the end, I feel the Theracephalians would be the most logical answer to this question. If there were a continent somewhere that had animals from the late Permian still living, and humans tried to live alongside them, I could see a band of hunter-gatherers finding a partner and a companion in some medium-sized therapsid like this. At first, it would be a partnership for the mutual gain of hunting and protection, especially in a world full of far more dangerous predators. Over time, tribal villages would turn into farms, and humans would domesticate dicynodonts as a source of food. But we had at that point made a friend out of the Theracephalians, and we started to breed them for reasons other than the utilitarian reasons of the past. Especially because as civilization grew, the large apex predators like Gorgonopsids were pushed to near extinction. We started to make different Theracephalians into house pets, with many different breeds to suit different lifestyles and tastes. But despite how widely different they would all appear, they would all be under a single species. Mosturinus familiaris, and as our race became a more sophisticated civilization, we would eventually create breeds that show almost nothing of what this once proud group of predators used to be. Because that's just what we do. Sorry, little guy. Now you have to endure the indignity of being given names like Gizmo and Tinkerbell. Ugh. Good job, humans. Seriously, why would humans take this and turn it into this? I don't know, Tim Tim. I just don't know. You people disgust me. I want to give a special thanks to two people today. Number one being Ellie Wallace for asking me the question that sparked this rabbit hole I just went down. And the second being Keenan Taylor, who not only helped me brainstorm this topic, but also supplied me with some of the fantastic artwork of Mosturinus familiaris and a lot of the other creatures. If you're not familiar with his work, I'm going to let him explain. Hi folks, Keenan here at Tales of Chimere. I am a scientific illustrator and fantasy author. The setting of my work, Chimere, is a distant planet. The indigenous life of this planet, microbes that the peoples of Chimere call magic, have been bringing Earth organisms to Chimere for many millions of years, and have bonded with many of them as hosts. These organisms have since evolved into many distinct groups and species, all using speculative biology to design my creatures. I have one anthology out, Tales of Chimere, 
and a second, Songs of the Inland Sea, set to be released on November 1st. This second anthology will feature a wide range of nautical stories, all set on boats, ships, and one from the perspective of a killer whale. If you want to know more about this project, please check out my channel at Tales of Chimere here on YouTube and other social media platforms. Thank you so much to my man Steve here at Paleoanalysis for this opportunity. Hope to see you all over there soon. Cheers, folks! Thanks again, Keenan. He's been a friend of the channel for a long time now, and I'm a huge fan of his work. So I'll leave a link in the description so you can check out his YouTube channel, his book, as well as the social media links where you can check out his artwork. Ever since I've met him, he has absolutely blown my mind with the things that he's able to create. And his is actually one of my favorite channels that I personally follow. I've often thought about how to get into speculative biology content myself because of how much I enjoy this. I love making our classic paleo content, but I really, really hope that this video does well enough to justify me making more stuff like this in the future. This is seriously so much fun. So if you enjoyed this, please help the algorithm bless this one by giving it a like. Maybe leave a comment with some other speculative biology topic you'd like to see trigger the right and left side of my brain simultaneously. Maybe it can be a series called Paleo What If or something. After all, as much as I know you all love the History of the Earth series, the fact is, we already know how it ends. And to those who are going to comment and say, oh, well, this makes no sense. There's no way that this could ever happen. I know it can never happen, but sometimes it's just fun to brainstorm a what if. Have a good one, everybody.